Join with me in saying the Lord's Prayer, and then we'll speak a blessing over the offering. Our Father, who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so upon the earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Lord, we pause in this day to consider the gift of life that you give us. Each moment is precious. May it count, Lord. May we use all that you give us to bring love and your glory to this earth. And before you're seated, if you'll just join me in going through the order of service, the statement of faith, Lord's Church, the Church. The faith of the new church is summarized as follows. I believe in one God, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whom is the divine trinity. A saving faith is to believe on him. Evil actions ought not to be done because they are of the devil and from the devil. Good actions ought to be done because they are of God and from God. Moreover, these things ought to be done by man as of himself. But he should believe that they are from the Lord, acting with him and through him. Please be seated. Paul, would you come and read to us? from Mark the Messiah today. This reading, the book of Mark, chapter 4. And he said, So is the kingdom of God, as if a man should cast seed into the ground, and should sleep, and rise night and day, and the seed should spring and grow up. He knoweth not how. For the earth bringeth forth fruits of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he putteth in the sickle, because the harvest is come. Jesus said we are blessed when we come to him and we hear his words and we obey them. We're going to go straight into Holy Supper before we have a, a talk to the children. Okay, would you read to us from Secrets of Heaven 5915? And I will sustain you there means a constant influx of spiritual life from the internal celestial. This is clear from the meaning of sustaining when spoken by Joseph, who represents the internal celestial, as an influx of spiritual life from the internal celestial. In the internal sense, sustainment is nothing else than the influx of goodness and truth from the Lord by way of heaven. This is how angels are sustained. And it is how a person's soul, that is our internal man, is sustained. This sustainment is what the sustaining of the external man by means of food and drink corresponds to. And for this reason, God is meant by food and truth by drink. The nature of this correspondence is also such that when we are eating food, the angels present with us, present with us, think of goodness and truth. And what is amazing, their ideas vary according to the different kinds of food that we eat. When therefore in the Holy Supper we receive bread and wine, the angels present with us think about the good of love and the good of faith, for the reason that bread corresponds to the good of love and wine to the good of faith. 
and because they correspond to them, they also carry the same meanings in the word. We're gathering around the Lord's table today to eat his bread and to drink his wine. And we have this amazing passage from Swedenborg here telling us that even the act of eating or drinking, it changes our states and it affects even the angels that are with us. It's a phenomenal thought. Depending on the kind of food you're eating or the drink you're drinking, it's changing the states both of us and the angels that are with us. So if I said today the tortoise and the hare, immediately we begin to think of you know, the Aesop fable, the parable of, of the tortoise and slow wins the race. So we, we're not thinking about literal tortoises and literal rabbits and what was his name and which town was it and where were these things that happened. We're immediately drawn towards that deeper understanding of what's being said. And when we gather around the Lord's table and we take that bread, immediately there is a change in the state of the angels that are with us. They're beginning to think of the Lord's influx of goodness that's been made available to us through the Lord's incarnation. In other words, if the Lord had never incarnated, we'd never be able to sit at a table with him and eat bread. Or we'd never be able to sit at a table and drink wine. But now, now the very act of eating bread as a body together immediately makes us think of the influx of God's love into the human race. So as we gather around the table this morning, Ken, would you come up and we get ready to take the Lord's bread. Let's join the angels today in thinking about goodness itself. The very influx of the Lord's life into us. We take this bread and it sustains our body, but we take his bread and it sustains our soul. On that faithful last night, the Lord sat around the table with the 12 disciples and he lifted the bread to heaven and he gave a blessing. And after he broke the bread and he looked at his disciples and he said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat. angels too in taking the Lord's cup and let us think of how truth flows from our heart into our mind and it nourishes us in the same way that a wine will nourish the mind, the palate and the body. The Lord lifted the cup to heaven in the presence of his disciples. He gave a blessing and he said to his disciples, this is my blood poured out for the remission of sins of many. Take and drink.
us, dear Lord, is that you are the light of the world. If we will walk in your light, we will know your life. Amen. I haven't got a lot of children here this morning, so I'll just address those little ones that are up the front here <coughs> with me. But fear not, because it is a good message for adult and child alike. Here is what we call Father Abraham, because he was the first to hear that call of the Lord in the, in, the, in the Bible as we have it today, to hear that call of the Lord and leave his land, which was ancient Babylon, and follow the Lord into the promised land. And he's, as you can see, he's very old. He has no child. And the Lord says, I'm going to give you a promise. <clears throat> You're going to have a child. And you see those stars above you, Abraham? Your children are going to outnumber those stars. And you will become the father of nations. An amazing promise. Well, Abraham did, in fact, have a son, as the Lord promised, a very elderly age, Isaac. This is the story where Isaac and Abraham are going up to the mountain, because the Lord said, take your son up there and offer him up as a sacrifice. A test, obviously. And the Lord stopped Abraham and provided a ram. Isaac went on to have a number of children. His first two were twins, Esau and Jacob. Now they're twins, but Esau got more of the hair DNA. I don't know why, but he was considered quite hairy. You could, uh, his father, when he got quite blind, Isaac in his old age could feel Esau's arm and say, oh yeah, that's Esau, he's quite hairy. You know, that's how he could tell them apart. But look here, this story where Esau was out in the uh, field working and Jacob was very good at cooking. He knew what he was doing this day. He cooked a beautiful pot of food. And Esau comes in, smelling it. Oh, give me some of that food. And Jacob's like, all right, but you give me something. In the what do you want? Anything. I want some of that food. Give me your birthright. What? I ah, have it. I want that pot of food. Not knowing what he was giving away. The birthright. We all today here have a birthright. Say after me. Yeah, just after me. Dear Lord Jesus, you are my heavenly Father. And I am your child. Amen. You have a birthright. You're born the, the child of God. And you don't want to ever give that away for just a pot of food or something. Whatever the world is offering you. And so Jacob convinced him to give him the birthright. This becomes a bit of an ongoing theme. Because Jacob then goes on to have 12 sons. And they fight over each other, but the blessing rests upon Joseph. The story of Joseph. Mm -hmm. Joseph and his many coloured coat. The blessing falls on Joseph, even though he's actually one of the youngest, the second youngest, I think. Is that right? Yeah, the second. Yeah, Benjamin's the youngest son. But he gets the blessing falling on him. And the brothers are all like, not fair. We want the blessing. We want to get a blessing. So they end up getting quite jealous. Joseph, quite angry with him. And to make matters worse, not worse, not only did he have it was a blessing of God on him, he had dreams and visions from God. And in this one particular dream, God says, I'm going to make it so that the sun, the moon, and the stars will bow down to you, Joseph. Sounds rather ominous for us adults, doesn't it? Sun, moon, and star bowing down. But it simply meant that earthly powers would submit and that Joseph would be given great power and responsibility. And that's exactly what happened. He ended up second to Pharaoh, ruling all of Egypt. But not before he got stuck in jail. Does anybody know how he got stuck in jail? What happened? Potiphar's wife, Rangie. Yeah, that's right. He first went into Egypt and people could see this guy's got something special. Potiphar being a wealthy businessman said, I want you to work for me. And Potiphar's wife thought, hmm, yes, a handsome young man and tried to seduce him. But Joseph was a man of integrity. He wouldn't have anything of it. So she immediately prayed in Egypt to scream and tore her own dress and said, he tried to seduce me. What could Potiphar do? Believe Joseph or his wife. Anyway, Joseph ends up in jail. But even in jail, blessings are happening. 
the, the jail keepers end up putting him in charge of things because he's suffering station day. Right. But you read this story, I read it with quite a lot of pain and angst. Because you can see that Joseph is sitting in jail going, what are you doing with me, God? Why am I here? And there's even uh, one time when the, uh, was it the bread maker? Yeah, I'm trying to remember. Was it the bread maker gets put in jail for a time? And Joseph gives him a good word from God and then says to the bread maker, put a good word in with the king for me. Get me out of here. And it seems to kind of backfire and Joseph ends up in jail even longer, like God's forgetting him or something. I read that with such pain, but what it tells me is that there are times in life where we don't know why we're in the situation we're in. It's kind of our jail. And there's a real pressure on us to think, I'm going to fix this. I'm going to make it better. And we make it worse. And we make it worse. But Joseph was a godly man, and he would trust God. He'd have patience in God. And so today's message is, grant me patience and grant it to me now. It doesn't quite work that way, does it? Grant me patience, Lord. Teach me patience. We have to trust that the, the Lord has a good plan here. And ultimately, Joseph gets out of jail and the Pharaoh recognises and notices him and he gets put in charge of all of Egypt. This is how it says it in the New Testament. It says... Oh, sorry. I wanted to show you a story first. This is the story here of Joseph getting into prison. Joseph was the wisest and most responsible son among Jacob's twelve sons. Because of this, Jacob gave Joseph a coat of many colors, which told the other brothers that when their father Jacob passed away, then Joseph would be the head of the family. His brothers were very jealous of him and hated him so much that one day they decided to sell him to some Ishmaelite merchants on their way to Egypt. This hurt Joseph very much. But Joseph, like his father Jacob, had always loved God and followed his ways and commands. He knew in his heart that even though his brothers betrayed him, God would take care of him no matter what happened to him. When the merchants arrived in Egypt, they sold Joseph to a man named Potiphar. Potiphar was a captain of the guard for the Egyptian king Pharaoh. Potiphar had a very high position and was well respected by the king. Potiphar saw very quickly that every decision that Joseph made and everything that Joseph did had great success in his household. Therefore, he put Joseph in charge over all his household matters. From then on, the blessing of the Lord was over everything in Potiphar's house and his fields. He left everything to Joseph and never had to worry about one detail in his life other than the food he ate. But Joseph's troubles were not over. One day, Potiphar's wife lied about Joseph, accusing him of doing something that he didn't do. And even though Joseph had done nothing wrong, Potiphar was very angry and decided to throw Joseph into the king's prison. Again, Joseph was very hurt and sad over the false accusations, but he knew that God would once again take care of him and help him. While Joseph was in prison, God showed him kindness and gave him great favor with the warden. The warden noticed that Joseph was very wise and had great skills to help him run the prison. Very soon, the warden gave Joseph all the responsibilities of running the prison and taking care of the prisoners. Joseph praised God for giving him success no matter what happened in his life. He knew God would always take care of his every need. Joseph is a story, it's telling us that you know life isn't necessarily going to go the way we plan. You know, we, we've got a plan, God has a plan. And you could think, why did why did the Lord allow this to happen to Joseph? But you know, it's not unless you read to the end, not unless you finish the story, 
you really feel at rest about what's going on. That's what I was going to say. This is what it tells us in the New Testament. It says in Romans 8, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. So even in jail, he gets put into a place of responsibility. Amazing. I, I want to say something to, too about this passage. This passage is not telling us that God is doing all these things to us. And God didn't put Joseph in jail. That was the wickedness of Potiphar's wife that put him in jail. God's not doing these things to us, but God is definitely working them to our good. He will bring out good out of what he's doing. And I love the way it says it like this in the book of Jeremiah. It says, I know... For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. But just, just bow your head one more time and we'll pray before we move on. Just say with me a little once, just say, Dear Lord, I trust you all my life for all the good that you will bring. Help me, Lord, in my times of trouble, to keep my eyes on you. The Lord wants us to have patience and trust that He will work it all to its good. Well, Renee, I think we're going to take the little ones off. We're going to um, sing while they're.
answer to this question, if I ask you to think for a moment, what is the kingdom of heaven?
But I went downstairs, it was evening time, and the meal was just finished. But I sat there and I ate. And these other three disciples came and said, What are you doing? We're fasting. And I looked up and said, Food doesn't defile you. It's what comes out of your heart that defiles you. And I went, Oh yeah, they sat down and had something to eat. <laughs> but you know, Jesus is, is you know, Paul's trying to say, if meat, if what you eat offends your brother, put it aside. But you're free to eat and drink, as the Lord tells you. But don't offend your brother. That's the important thing. Because the kingdom of God is not about what you eat. Don't eat. The kingdom of God is about righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. That togetherness that you were talking about, okay? You're sitting there eating something and your brother's sister sitting there looking at you going, Wow. What? Sinner. How dare they? Alcoholic. Beastly. We wouldn't think that about each other. But the point is that people do stumble over what we eat. It's true. It's very hot topic. And here, the Lord's saying, it's not what matters. Uh-huh. And so the Lord himself is teaching us here about the kingdom of heaven, which we were saying is about having that peace in your heart. And he's saying, it's like a farmer that sows the seed. And the farmer doesn't really understand how the seed contains power. I mean, we can use science today, can't we? We can look at science and we can say, well, you know, we can say, uh, right, we know the processes the seed goes through. But we really still don't understand that claim power. No one does. If we did, we could prove it because we could take together raw ingredients, put them together and create life. We can't. Never can, never will. Because to do that would be to God, to put the spark of life. The spark belongs to the Lord. What the Lord is saying here is that this power of the seed is His. We have a part to play. That's to plant the seed. We will never make that seed germinate. We can water it, give it sunshine. That's our part to play. But, but the power belongs to the Lord. And he's teaching us this little teaching and saying, this is what the kingdom of God is like. I don't know, I don't know about you, but hopefully, like me, you've sat there and gone, I'm still not getting it. Why would Jesus talk about this? Like, you're teaching us about the kingdom of God, but then you're saying there's the invisible power of seeds. Well, what's going on here? Well, we're going to go there today. We're going to look at you know, a couple of ideas of why exactly does the power of the seed have to be kept secret? And, and the answer ultimately is for our blessing, for our delight, for our joy. In fact, it has completely to do with free will. Free will. A free will. The Lord wants to keep us in free will. Look at what it says here in Divine Providence. If we sensed and felt the working of Divine Providence, we would not act freely and rationally. And nothing would seem to be really ours. The same would hold true if we knew what was going to happen. If we had something, if we knew what the future was going to bring, then you just feudalist. You'd be kind of what's going to happen. But here's the mystery. The future's going to happen whether you do nothing or something. But the Lord wants to involve us, that togetherness. He wants to partner with us. And I really like this idea because you see out in spiritual circles this idea that we're creative and we have power. Yes, it's true. You know, we're made in God's image. God created by speaking and we create by speaking. Yes, we create by speaking. That's what prayer is. But we're doing it in partnership with Him. Right? We don't Otherwise, if you just take the power of God and abuse it, that's called witchcraft. But we're meant to use the power of God, creatively with Him, and do something. Now, if the Lord was just going to do it all for us and show it to us, well, we'd be like passively watching a movie. And that's kind of what uh, you know, this passage is saying to us. The Lord wants us to partner and He wants us to act and find the joy in being a part of praying for someone, or acting in love towards them, or doing something like that. Now, if you can see in the background there, I've got a picture of food. And I love this analogy. This is what I felt the Lord showed me. When I was asking the Lord about why is your power kept secret from us, and I felt this analogy is what the Lord gave me. Imagine enjoying food, and then you had to sit there and concentrate on digesting it breaking it down into a million pieces, sending it through the body. You know, if you had to take care of all those processes, how much fun would eating be? It's not going to be much fun, is it? 
<laughs> we get the better part. We really do. The Lord says, eat, drink, be merry. I'll take care of all of that. Isn't that a, a blessing? I mean, since you've sat in that chair this morning, millions of processes have gone on inside your body. And you haven't had to be conscious of one of them. People who want to be God. <sighs> Nonsense. We get the better deal. The much better deal. We, we get to partake with God. Enjoy. Enjoy the food. Enjoy. And let Him take care of all the rest. There'd be no free will or freedom without that. And so ultimately, a lot of these things are kept hidden from us. Not because the Lord is trying to keep something from us, but actually to leave us in freedom and joy and peace. It's a good analogy. Anyway, it works for me. I hope it's working for you, this idea of you know, enjoying food. Now, this is just my kind of sense of humor. Right? Uh, we can trust in the Lord's promises, is what the, the parable is telling us. But, you know, the Lord could come into our life, you know, destroying all the bad things and shooting up all the enemy. And, you know, and sometimes if you feel like that's God doing that in your life, it's not. It'll be the hells, I promise. If your life's being all shot up into pieces, it'll be the hells, I promise. But sometimes we want God to come in and kind of like, oh, just get rid of all the bad stuff. Get rid of all the bad ones. Or maybe this is a better analogy. Boom. Just, you know, wouldn't it be nice just to sort of stop the hell once and for all? Boom. But it's not how the Lord works. Now, I know these analogies are flawed because we're not trying to glorify war or anything like that. But we are in a war. We're in a war with the hells for our soul. So this is probably a better analogy. <laughs> Much better. The Lord is very, very gentle, very careful in his life about what he targets and what he hits. Because we all know the term friendly fire, don't we? Where, you know, you're shooting the good guy, not the bad guy. In fact, this is exactly what the writings teach. The Lord could not deal with our evils. Or it would end up it would end up in that. Bang. The Lord would approach, <coughs> it would all the hells would be destroyed. So the Lord became one of us and one by one took out our enemies. And this is why it can feel like in your own life it's very slow. The process can be a little slow and what are you doing, Lord? One by one he's dealing with our, our, our issues. One by one carefully doing it. It's a good analogy. <laughs> Although for Here's what Isaiah, how Isaiah puts it, 55.10. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and returns not hither and waters the earth and makes it bring forth bud and make and may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. And then it goes on to say, so shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing that I've sent it to. Alright, so the promises of God for us are maybe, no, you didn't pass, you weren't good enough. Or, what does the scripture say? The promises of God are yes and amen. But here's the challenge for us. We pray, we sow a seed, we ask the Lord for something, and the process is invisible. In fact, you may even feel like, did I have any effect at all? But what the Lord is teaching us today is, yes, trust. Trust like the farmer that doesn't know how the seed works, but he knows that the seed will work. Today, what the Lord is saying to us through this parable is know that when you pray and ask the Lord for something, he's hearing you. His answer is yes and amen. And he will bring his goodwill to pass over your life. Now, qualify. I, you know, can I have three million dollars? Can I be king of the earth? Can I do, you know? Okay, we have to be reasonable and we have to follow the guidelines of love. But that's it. Follow the guidelines of love. If what you're asking for is for the sake of love, then be reassured. Not only has God heard you, he's already said yes. He's already germinating your prayer before it's even kind of come out of your mouth. But he does need you to so. He needs, needs you and me to take that action and so. And I've said before, our thoughts are prayer. Our desires are prayers. But when we open our mouth and speak, 
we are giving the Lord seed. It's how he created in Genesis, and it's how he made us. So there's a, it's, it's not that you have to do it in public or something. The Lord said, go away into your closet quietly, but use, use your voice, speak, send that word vibrating out there, and then let the Lord bring back the return as he says he will. He says it will prosper. And specifically if you're praying according to his word, it can't fail. Can it? Praying according to the word, it will come back. The challenge for us is can we be patient? Whether we're asleep, that means we're totally ignorant, or we're awake, we can at least see the effects of our prayers that we do. Or whether we patiently sit there and watch, or we go and do something else. The Lord has promised, if you speak to that mountain, get up and be moved and plant to the ocean, and doubt not, you'll have it. You'll have whatever you say. And I love the way he says, whosoever speaks to the mountain. He didn't say, anyone who believes in me. He doesn't say, if you are a Christian, he just says, whosoever. If they speak to a mountain, doubt not, it will obey. So the doubting is where we kind of start digging at the ground. It, is it, pull the seed out, is it working? Oh, I think I broke it. Isn't it? Well, what does that look like? Well, that means you ask God for something and you go and ask him again. Then you ask him again. Well, maybe he didn't hear me. I'll ask him again. And ask him again. And every time you're digging up that seed, so what do we do? Well, here's what we do. Here's all we have to do. This is coming up next. The idea of prayer as a seed. Here's what we do. We need to till the ground. Tilling the ground is our job. And that means shunning evil. That's all. Really simple. If we practice shunning evil, Swinburne tells us that is the first of all love and charity. What a phenomenal idea. Just to shun evil is the first of all love. And it's basically giving the ground room. It's getting all the rocks and the weeds and all the other stuff out. Stuff that's going to block, you know, and it's giving nutrients to the soil. So tilling the ground. So we shun evil wherever we can, as often as we can. Secondly, well, we've got to water. No, we've got to plant the seed, sorry. We've got to plant the seed, and I'm talking about that. But in, in this case, we're talking about prayer. Plant the seed, go away quietly somewhere, and pray. Now what I do, I don't know if you've noticed, but if you ask me for praying for something, have you noticed that I kind of grab you straight away and pray? Have you noticed that? Because I had a period in my walk with God where people would come up and say, Pastor, pray for me. I will pray for you. A day goes by, two days go by, three days go by, a week goes by. I'm doing something with the Lord. I get a tap on my shoulder. You haven't prayed for that person. Oh, it's just that easy. But it's also very easy to say a prayer right now. Lord bless you, man, with abundant artistic hands and this luck of Jesus there and there. It's that easy to sow a seed. Just right then and there. And you know what I found? 10, 20, 30 second prayers are just as powerful as long trying to find the right words. It's not about the words. It's not about how long it is or short it is. It's about the act. Act now. Say a prayer for someone. Can you pray that? Yep, I'm going to pray right now for you. Right. And what do I pray for? I speak out that which I want the Lord to do. And so then what do you do? Well, I don't go and dig it up. From that point on, if I think about that person, I'll just go to thanking the Lord. Just thank him. You know, later on you'll think, Lord, I, I thank you that Gay's just loving her art. She's just getting so good at it. She's just enjoying it. And we're all getting to see the blessings of her artwork. Or whatever it is. So when you think about that person in the future, you don't need to dig the seed up and replant it. Just give it a little bit of, bit of water. Thank you. Oh, no, that was the next point, sorry. Water the seed. Now, we're talking about prayer, but the seeds in our life can be everything and anything. So, what about my thoughts? They're seeds. What about my feelings? They're seeds. And what about my actions? Well, they're fruit. I meant to. Oh, Renee was going to cut open for me a piece of dragon fruit. We have, here. have you ever seen the red dragon fruit? You cut it open, and it's delicious um, flesh of the fruit, and it's loaded with all these little black seeds. This is the thing about action. That's why I like praying out loud. Action. 
actions are seeds, but they're actually fruit. Right? And every fruit, you can't eat a watermelon and not get a few seeds, can you? You can spit them out, but you'll get a few. When you eat fruit, you get a seed as well. That's awesome. So, you know, uh, we were talking in the last Mark and the Messiah about let your light so shine that every act of love shines. And that's fruit. But there's seeds in there as well. Sprinkled all through it. Is that a nice thought? Yeah. So, we're talking here about watering the seeds. So, we're talking about prayer, but you can apply this to any of the truths of God that you are acting on. Right? How do I water those seeds? Meditate. Meditation. Meditation on the truth. Meditating on scripture and what it says. Meditating on the promises of God. Which is something that I think we all do at different times. Some of us do it daily, some weekly, and some randomly when the, the moment stirs us. But th that's why we come to church. We come to church because it's a watering act. It's an act of hearing more of the word and letting those promises fill our hearts and mind as it waters those previous seeds that we planted. And then, of course, you've got to nurture the seed. Well, I was talking about that just then in actions, because actions are much louder than words. And actions of love are that warmth and that sunshine that's going to help those seeds grow. That's our part to play today. We speak the word in prayer, whatever the Lord's asked us to do. We shun evil to make sure the soil is good. We meditate on the promises of God. And if you meditate on that person, Lord, I thank you for that promise, whatever it is you're doing for them. Rather than asking God again. Asking again is unbelief. You speak to the mountain and you doubt not. It's going to do as you're told to do. So there's that meditating. And then finally, acts of love, of course, which is something that we endeavor to practice anyway. The point being here is that today with this parable, the Lord is really wanting to encourage our heart. He's wanting to remind us that the invisible side is his. Don't be troubled. Just be a good, believing child that says, my parents says yes and I'm going to get it. Mum, Dad said this and it's going to happen. Well, in our case, our Heavenly Father, it's his delight to give good gifts, even to the wicked, pouring out the rain on the wicked and the good alike. Now, there's one area I just want to take a slight diversion, if I may, if that's all right, about attracting more angels in our life. Who'd like to attract more angels in their life? I know I would. I mean, angels are with us all the time. But I reckon if we can attract more, then that'll keep away the, the dark spirits and the genii and the evil spirits more, isn't it? So we want to attract more angels into our life. Here is a, an amazing little passage, and I've decided to put it in here this morning because it has to do with the kingdom of heaven and, and the fact that it is peace, it is righteousness, peace and joy, or happiness and joy. That togetherness that you're talking about, okay? The joy of togetherness. Here it is, let's have a look. Attracting angels into our life. The angels of heaven cannot possibly join us in bodily and worldly pleasures. I'm glad there's no full stop there. I'm glad he keeps going. He says, until that pleasure is brought under control. We have to stop viewing it as the goal in itself and view it instead as useful and subservient to heavenly pleasures. Whenever you see this word heavenly pleasure, I want you to think of heavenly use. Right? So, let's say food is your thing. Let's just say you absolutely love food. In fact, I'm sure all of us here do love food. Yeah? But let's say food was really an issue in your life and you keep going to food to try and change your states. When I'm depressed, I'll go and eat. You know, we have a word, uh, hanger. Do we, do we, anyone heard that word hanger? Oh, you're angry because you haven't eaten. Go and eat. That's true. It can be very true. But, but often, you know, food can be such a delightful thing that we can use it and almost use it like a medicine sometimes too. We keep changing the way our states are. And then we become obsessed and maybe, maybe we do become gluttonous and we overeat and we you know, keep going to certain foods that we shouldn't, all that kind of stuff. But if it, if it weren't for passages like this, we'd be left with traditional Christian thinking that says, go and live in a monastery, fast, eat grass or whatever, you know, some Jew here is all about denial. And now if food is an issue, I think fasting can be great. 
it can be good at times. It can help you break maybe your obsession with it a little bit. But I'm so grateful that it is only one of many solutions we have to these problems. Here Swedenborg is saying, simply make that pleasure, whatever it is, subservient. Now how hard is it if someone invites you over to bring something with you? We, we, we do it all organically, don't we? I'll bring some cake or some biscuits or a, a salad or something. You just want to share. Why is that? What, what, what is it that we want to bring something and share? It's taking a natural, worldly joy or pleasure and giving it a heavenly use. Is it? Eating together. There's something amazing about eating together. It takes a natural thing and turns it into a spiritual thing. So if you've got an obsession with food, I would say cook things that you love and give it away. Bless people with it. Isn't that a nice idea? Take that. In fact, that's all we have to do. All worldly pleasures are simply pleasures that have been separated from love, separated from the, the, the heavenly use. But he goes on to say here, just make it subservient to that heavenly pleasure or heavenly use. And he goes on to say, once this happens, angels can join us in both kinds of pleasure. So you've got to figure out how, if, if, if you love uh, surfing, you just got to figure out a way to turn it into a heavenly use. Yeah. There'll be a way, just give it some thought. You know, whatever it is that you love that, that makes you feel alive, figure out a way to share it with others so that it's not in, it, in and of itself just a worldly pleasure. And I'm saying that for a reason, because what we're about to read is, well, maybe disturbing, but we'll see. Let's go. Once this happens, angels can join us in both kinds of pleasure. At that point, pleasure becomes a benefit to us and eventually in the other life, life a source of happiness. How wonderful is that? But here's what he goes on. This is where it gets a little disturbing. Here's what he goes on to say. He says, uh, those who think the delights of earthly self before rebirth is not from hell and that they are not possessed by devilish spirits are much mistaken. So just think about that. I don't want to go on until we've read. He's saying, if you're into natural worldly pleasure just for its sake alone, and you think that's okay, three people are saying, well, you need to know you're actually in union with devils. Wow. That's pretty, pretty disturbing. And it goes on to say, people do not know, uh, they do not know how, how matters stand with humankind. Before we have been reborn, demons and hellish spirits possess our earthly self, though, for all we can see, we are no different than anyone else. In other words, evil spirits are looking to live through us. That's what's happened. It's quite, quite, a, quite, a, quite an interesting thought, isn't it? You know, that if you're being you know, pulled into this pleasure all the time, whatever it is, over and over and over again, there is some dark spiritual force that's living through you through you. It's quite an interesting thought, isn't it? And a very motivating one to not want to look anything more than you. So I would be ruled by dark forces. And all we have to do is take those things and give them heavenly uses. How marvellous is that? Because, you know, well, again, when I look at the mainstream Christianity, my options are fast. Die to self. Deny all. And yet, fruits of the Spirit Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, self-control. Um, there's nine of them. Notice it's not abstinence. Fruit of the Spirit is not abstinence. It's self-control. That means have it in your life. Don't deny it. But just let it be a blessing, a part of, you know, serving others, rather than the, the, the trying to deny it. Now, I think there are times where that is probably the best. There is the only strategy. I mean, if you've got someone that is alcoholic, then maybe the best strategy is that they do just shut that area of their life off. But that's rather an exception. Okay, I'm putting that exceptions here. The Lord put us here to, 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 to He says, I've come to give you life and life abundantly. Isn't that good news? And all we have to do to get more of these angels in our life is just think about what are the things that I like and how can I serve other people with those things. And the promise is you'll have the angels join in with you more and more and more with those things. Is that good news? Yeah. I think it is. It's a great idea. <clears throat> okay, so for takeaway, 
on this parable today, we have that the promises of God are yes and amen for us. That's where we start. Let's start with that conviction. Whatever it is you're looking to the Lord for, whatever need, His promise to you is yes and amen. It has to be His love. Then all we have to do is we shun evil, plant good seeds, water it, and nurture it. That's our part to do. And the Lord promises, whatever it is, you will have it. And that's such good news for me. Let's pray. To say, dear Lord, we trust in you. You are good. Always. Teach us, Lord, the secret path of prayer. Of how to pray, how to rest, and to receive the good things of your kingdom. Amen. And that's what I would say as a, a, a takeaway. Every prayer is a seed. We can trust the Lord. Peace and assurance is what comes when we trust in Him and peace is His kingdom. So this month, try and make a fresh commitment to saying no to whatever is stealing your peace. If something steals your peace, say to yourself, I don't want that. And make a commitment to finding out what that is and how to stop that, whatever stealing your peace. Two, strengthen your resolve to communicate more with the Lord and learn to rest in those promises. It's my hope and desire that you gain something today from, from this reading of Mark. The kingdom of heaven is like a, a secret seed that we can plant. May we go on planting lots of good seeds and resting in the Lord's power to bring those seeds to come to pass in our life. If you will just join me in singing the steadfast love of the Lord as I close.